Welcome. I'm Brent Glass, Executive Director of the Sing Sing Prison Museum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to Justice Talks, a series produced by the museum. This is the seventh program uh, in our Justice Talks series. The Sing Sing Prison Museum is under development in Ossining, New York, and we are governed by a volunteer board of trustees as a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to tell the story, the complex and compelling 200 year history of Sing Sing Prison, one of America's most famous and most unique uh, institutions of incarceration, and also to inspire all of us to imagine a more equitable justice system and to take action to build a better society. Uh, tonight, I want to thank our sponsors, uh, J. Philip Real Estate, uh, Philip Ferranda, uh, principal there, is a member of our uh, board of trustees and also thank Humanities New York. Uh, the mission of Humanities New York is to strengthen civil society and the bonds of community, using the humanities to fo foster engaged inquiry and dialogue around social and cultural concerns. Humanity, Humanities New York's grants ensure that New Yorkers have access to cultural programming that promotes important and timely conversations. And um, I, I'm very pleased that uh, in this month of Women's History Month that we have a very important and timely conversation um, that uh, we're very uh, pleased to share with you this evening. Um, I know that you're going to have uh, some questions uh, for our speaker following her presentation, so uh, you can put your, your questions in the Q&A uh, uh, file uh, in the chat uh, on, on your screen. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Jennifer Graber, who is Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Texas, Austin. She is the Shive Lindsay and Gray Professor in the History of Christianity, and also the Interim Director of Native American and, and Indigenous Studies. She has a PhD uh, from Duke University, and she works on religion and violence and interreligious encounters in American prisons and on the American frontier. Her first book, The Furnace of Affliction, Prisons and Religion in Antebellum America was published in 2011, explores the intersection of church and state during the founding of America's first prisons. Her latest book, The Gods of Indian Country, Religion and the Struggle for the American West, published in 2018, considers religious of uh, for transformations among Kiowa Indians and Anglo-Americans during their conflict uh, over Indian territory in what is now known as Oklahoma. Professor Graber teaches uh, undergraduate classes on the history of religion in the United States, religion in the American West, Native American religions and religious freedom. She teaches graduate seminars on religion and violence, religion and empire, and approaches to the study of religion in the United States. Uh, Jennifer grew up in a Mennonite community in Northern Indiana in a religious tradition actively engaged in prison visitation. When she was 10, she accompanied her mother and her Sunday school class to the Indiana State Prison in Michigan City. She had a pen pal who was incarcerated there, sent him letters and sticks of gum and visited him in prison several times. So she brings a unique personal and professional perspective to this subject. I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Jennifer Graber. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be here tonight. I'm so grateful for the invitation and I'm so grateful for the work that the Sing Sing Prison Museum is doing to develop this historic site, but also to make sure that it's connecting the history of that institution with contemporary questions that we have about criminal justice uh, and the possibilities of restorative justice. Um, I'm gonna start a few slides here for you. Are you able to see my screen? Oops, here we go. Let's try one more time. There we go. All right, 
So I want to start with two images um, produced in the 1840s. The first depicts a punishment employed at Auburn Prison, the New York institution that preceded Sing Sing. In the pamphlet, um, a visitor to Auburn describes how buckets of cold water were poured over an offender's head. He said inmates usually changed their ways after two buckets of cold water, but some took as many as 12 or 13 before giving up resistance. The writer, a prison reformer from Pennsylvania, approved of what had, been, uh, what had come to be known as the shower bath. To him, it was a humane alternative to the whip. Indeed, he assured readers of the shower bath safety, saying, I inquired particularly of the physician of the institution and it's no danger was to be apprehended from this process. He seems to be immovably settled in the opinion that it is perfectly innocent and perhaps conducive to the health of the subject. The second image comes from a book about criminal offenders and phrenology, the 19th century science of reading the surface of the head to explain human behavior. The drawing of an inmate's head at the top and the portrait of another at the bottom were made by Eliza Farnham, matron of Sing Sing's female department from 1844 to 1847. She described the woman depicted in the line drawing as a 30 year old white female incarcerated for larceny. Farnham explained that the quote, whole moral region of her head showed extremely imperfect development. Farnham described the woman in the second image as, quote, totally abandoned and profligate. And she claimed that this inmate's head um, had showed a clear shape of total destitution of moral endowment. While these physical diagnoses might seem irreversibly damning, Farnham said otherwise. She said uh, in a later work, I have found nothing more encouraging in the treatment of criminals than the excellent effect which flows from imparting to them a knowledge of the peculiar constitution of their own minds. In Sing Sing's women's department, Farnham advocated a prison discipline of educational and aesthetic uplift that would repair the negative effects of genetic inheritance and cruel environment that could be read in a criminal's head. These two images reveal stark differences between men's and women's experience of incarceration in the 1840s, if not most of the 19th century in New York. I wanna talk about how politicians, ministers, and community leaders imagined women's difference from men and how that imagined difference, imagined difference impacted the prison disciplines developed for women. And I also wanna show how prisons for women, as evidenced by Farnham's unconventional methods, were quite removed from the pitched arguments about disciplining male offenders in this period. And so women's prisons, especially the one at Sing Sing, proved to be a site for experimenting with new prison discipline possibilities. The icy water poured over the male inmate was intended to bring his offense home to him through the experience of bodily pain. It was meant to convince him to reject wrongdoing and perhaps eventually realize the error of his ways. The women offenders sketched by Farnham were not to be punished for their crimes that resulted in incarceration. Rather, she recommended an environment meant to build up that which the offender's skull revealed to be undeveloped or underdeveloped. This work required books, prayer, handicrafts, a piano, not icy cold water. Farnham was unusual. Even the most sympathetic prison reformers of her time did not recommend novels and music for male offenders. In this period, the most radical reform voices for men's incarceration simply called for limits to corporal punishment. They insisted that strict silence, total separation at night, and congregate manual labor by day would teach men the extent of their errors and the potential for freedom through hard work. Even as New York State allowed male inmates to be whipped, along with a variety of other corporal punishments, including the shower bath, it forbade the whipping of female inmates. And even those reformers who found Farnham's methods strange and a little too modern, insisted that women require different treatment than men. And I wanna talk about what I think are kind of three primary reasons uh, for the different disciplinary regimes that were tried for women. First, 
American culture in this period was marked by a particular understanding of women's difference that manifested in markedly different opportunities, limits, and experiences in almost all aspects of life. Antebellum society emphasized the rough and tumble world of men's industrial labor and political participation. In contrast, women were thought to exemplify a purity made possible by their seclusion in the home. Theirs was the domestic sphere where they kept house and reared children, uplifting everyone around them, including their world-weary husbands. To be sure, only a small portion of American women had access to the resources required for this domestic ideal. Even so, the idea persisted. Male leaders decried the effects of women working outside the home, even as so many women did out of economic necessity. And working women strove for this ideal as well, even as the fantasy was fueled by popular women's magazines. One effect of this domestic ideal, what scholars have called separate spheres for the two genders, is that women were often disciplined by more informal means. Family and kin networks acted when their female relations stepped out of place. Women's criminal offenses also were typically minor and handled in local courts and county jails, if at all. And this brings me to the second factor that affects how women were treated in uh, prisons in the 19th century. Very few American women served time in prison before the 1840s. This was true from the beginning of New York's prison experiment with Newgate Prison in New York City. Even though Newgate had large common rooms, prison staff tried to keep men and women apart. Architectural plans show that female offenders exercised in a separate yard from the men. But staff also wanted to separate inmates based on the seriousness of their offenses, which they attempted in the men's sections. But this simply didn't work on the women's side, as the female inmates were almost all incarcerated for the same relatively minor crime, larceny. And you'll see here, this is uh, some statistics from 1801, whereas there are 250 white men and 57 black men at, incarcerated at Newgate at the time, there are only 23 women and uh, white women and 14 black women. So they make up a very small percentage of the prison uh, population. And uh, you'll see also that they segregate, uh, that they differentiate between white women prisoners and black women prisoners. And I wanna come back to the race question uh, in a little later. A growing number of male offenders, as well as the desire to keep trying to separate inmates in individual cells led to the construction of Auburn Prison starting in 1816, and then later uh, Sing Sing uh, in the late 1820s. And despite the intricate planning for solitary confinement cells and labor workshops, um, neither Auburn nor, for men, neither Auburn nor Sing Sing's design took much account of women, at least at first. Changes in prison discipline at the state level also ignored women. In 1819, New York reinstated whipping as a possible punishment for New York's male inmates. Women, however, were not to be whipped. At Auburn, which is featured here on the slide, the small number of female inmates occupied an attic room where they had no supervision other than short daily visits by kitchen staff who brought them meals and carried out waste buckets. The attic conditions were terrible little ventilation, nothing to do, and women offenders were sometimes subject, subjected to sexual abuse and illegal punishments by male guards. In 1827, a female inmate at Auburn died after an illegal whipping by a guard. The incident caused public outcry. In 1832, state officials finally hired a matron to oversee Auburn's 25 female inmates in the attic but little changed as the attic space was not designed with any particular disciplinary program in mind. Um, and this is so ironic because Auburn was so uh, planned with such intricacy and so many resources went into the construction of the solitary cells for men and the workshops uh, for them to work in during the day. And yet the women are an afterthought and put in the attic. The matron's hiring was one of several signs that state officials increasingly felt the need to address the small but persistently present population of incarcerated women. Eventually, they decided to build a women's unit at Sing Sing. This time, women's experience of incarceration was meant to look more like that of men. The female unit was built to follow Auburn and Sing Sing's model in which men were uh, separately confined at night. 
Um, here is a little uh, excerpt from a map of Ossining, and you can see the prison uh, the, for men, which is on, uh, on the edge of the river. But the women's prison is up on the hill and has these very interesting uh, columns. Um, but you can see on the sides a bunch of little windows. Um, there were three tiers that had 24 separate cells each. Um, the women's prison at Sing Sing also included a nursery and a workshop. And while the women's nighttime routines looked like the same, looked the same as the men, their daytime lives were quite different. There was no analog to the manual labor performed by men in Sing Sing's mines and workshops. The rule of silence was not enforced. And women, while they could be gagged and kept in cells with uh, small amounts of food, could not be punished with a lash. As Sing Sing's women's unit opened, the number of incarcerated women remained low. But this would change, and one aspect of that change brings to my, me to my third point about the way women's criminality and incarceration were viewed uh, quite differently than men's in this period. Starting in the 1840s, New York's female inmate population grew as courts convicted more women of crimes related to social disorder. This trend included more punishments for women involved in sex work, which was viewed in a particularly devastating way for women in this period. This was especially true for Black and immigrant women. Starting in the 1840s, more male polit uh, political and religious leaders condemned what they called fallen women involved in sex work. Um, and here's uh, an image that was popular in the period uh, that's meant to portray uh, a, a fallen woman engaged in prostitution. And I don't know if you can see the cursive uh, subtitle there, but it says, hooking a victim. Uh, and the victim here is the man. Um, the notion that these male leaders had as they diagnosed the problem of fallen women was that uh, women needed to be especially pure and virtuous. Um, and so these women had uh, committed a kind of especially problematic sin. Um, so here's a quote from one uh, chaplain at a state penitentiary in Ohio. He says, no one without experience can tell the obduracy of the female heart when hardened and lost in sin. As a woman falls from a higher point of perfection, so she sinks to a profounder depth of misery than man. Uh, so you can see how there's this kind of extra um, sense of this criminality because she's supposed to be so elevated. And yet when she falls, she's even further down than any male offender could possibly be. Some prison reformers, male prison reformers, claimed that sex workers were actually beyond reach, going against their broader approach to prison discipline that argued that all lawbreakers, if subjected to the right prison discipline, could be redeemed. They reserved especially harsh rhetoric for Black women and immigrant women whose sex work resulted in incarceration. For instance, the Quaker reformer who designed Newgate Prison and ran it for several years said Black women incarcerated there for sex work were a sign of, quote, the race's degeneracy. This skeptical attitude of incarcerated women helps explain uh, why, even, why New York's male leaders built a new institution to house female offenders at Sing Sing, yet still had no reformatory plan for them. That's because they weren't sure these women could be redeemed. It took female reformers' involvement to change women's experience of incarceration in New York. Many claimed to be inspired by British prison reformer Elizabeth Fry, who began visiting incarcerated women in London in 1815. Her popular 1827 book claimed that female offenders could be reformed and that other women should make it possible. New York women responded. In 1832, they formed the New York Female Benevolent Society, which encouraged sexual purity among women and tried to rescue women from sex work. They opened a house of refuge for women exiting prison or sex work, but they soon disbanded. Another group, the New York Female Re Moral Reform Society, later took up the torch. They added an emphasis on the social problems, such as unemployment and poverty that might lead women into sex work. And they began to critique the double standard that allowed men to engage with sex, sex workers with little social fallout. Um, and this is one of the cartoons put out um, by groups like this uh, Moral Reform Society in which they are naming uh, prominent New York men and exposing the fact that they would uh, engage in sex work or uh, would engage with women in sex work. <clears throat> 
women in these reform groups were part of a chorus of voices calling for a new prison specifically for women that also had a disciplinary plan, especially for women. In 1837 then, the female inmates who were kept at New York City's Bellevue Hospital were moved up to the new building for women at Sing Sing, and most of the women in the attic at Auburn arrived soon after. By 1842, Sing Sing's female department had a matron and two assistants. But as I noted earlier, there was still no robust disciplinary plan. No one had really come up with anything yet. The rule of silence was not enforced, and female inmates had almost nothing to do during the daytime. The women's prison became increasingly chaotic at Sing Sing. It was soon overcrowded, not only with women, but also with children born on the site. Once again, guards engaged in illegal corporal punishments, and there were rumors of a riot in the women's prison. A new organization uh, founded in the 1840s took up the question of women's discipline and decided that they were going to do something about it. Um, they were called the Prison Association of New York. The larger organization uh, took up a variety of prison reform issues, but their female department addressed conditions at Sing Sing specifically. And in 1844, uh, members of the Prison Association of New York advocated for the appointment of a new matron at Sing Sing. In 1844, reformer and author Eliza Farnham began her new post, and she had an unconventional plan for it. So I want to take a moment to imagine what Sing Sing looked like and felt like and was like on a daily uh, basis for women under Farnham's direction. All right, so we're going to do a little imagination work here. Farnham had little interest in the silent rule um, and had it rescinded in January 1846. She converted the large communal spaces into uh, a room that approximated what was like a European salon. The bookshelves held not only the King James Bible, but also novels by Charles Dickens and texts on phrenology. Farnham encouraged women to read individually and read out loud to them herself. She provided supplies so women could take up sewing and do very intricate needlepoint. She purchased glass cases to display inmates' handiwork. To help her, she hired Georgiana Bruce, a local transcendentalist who had lived at Brook Farm where she had literary conversations with Ralph Waldo Emerson and Margaret Fuller. And to cap it all off, Farnham brought in a piano. Lest you think I'm showering praise on Farnham, I want to explain her disciplinary philosophy. More than anything, she wanted women to understand what caused them to commit criminal offenses and what they needed to do in order to live as free and productive citizens. And in that sense, she's not all that different from the chaplains and other prison reformers, I think. According to Farnham, it was not Christianity that had the answers. It was the human head. Its surface could be read to understand what aspects of a person were underdeveloped, if not severely damaged. The shape of the head revealed how inheritance, environment, or injury caused an offender's maladjustment to everyday life. It explained how they turned to crime instead of keeping a steady course of upright behavior. Having read an inmate's head, Farnham claimed to know what aspects of an offender needed attention, cultivation, and support. Sing Sing's female department, with its books and flowers and piano, was meant to build up these underdeveloped aspects. Once built up, inmates could move about again in civil society and participate as equals and contributors. As she later wrote, I have found nothing more encouraging in the treatment of criminals than the excellent effect which flows from imparting to them a knowledge of the peculiar constitution of their own minds, a quote I read earlier as well. As an example of this process, she pointed to an African-American inmate who uh, she claimed to have said that she realized it wasn't the devil who had caused her to break the law like she had always thought, but rather her head revealed she had lower propensities and a derangement in the brain. But under Farnham's care, this narrative that Farnham produced but is attributed to the inmate said, that she believed now in a higher being who had also given her, quote, very high and noble qualities that she could develop and exercise so as to have a good life. So even as Farnham viewed this work as humane and liberal, there is an aspect to it that is quite chilling, at least to me. Her drawings of inmates and confident assessments of their deficiencies I are a little unnerving. 
um, especially in her references to immigrant women and to black women. And I just wanna show you two illustrations um, from her later book. So this illustration, she um, gives the initial CP and describes this woman as a half-breed Indian and Negro woman. Um, and her assessment of her is that in her head, destructiveness is enormously developed with large secretiveness and caution and very defective benevolence and moral organs generally. And here's another example, TZ, who she describes as a Jewess of German birth and parentage. But the most striking feature of her head is the extreme shortness from individuality to philoprogenitiveness. I'm not even quite sure, I think she made that up. Her impatience and restlessness prevented the side view from even being taken. The length must be less than an average by, an, uh, by the average by an inch and a half or two inches. Um, and so I don't know if it feels this way to you, but when I look at these drawings and I look at her assessments, which she says with such confidence, um, it's, it's hard to see and it's hard to, I think, uh, not see the kind of prejudice and discrimination that might rise from that sort of physical reading of women's bodies, uh, particularly black women and immigrant women. Um, and one of the things that she actually does later in life is present her own image uh, and provides a, a phrenological reading of her own head. And to no one's surprise, she is a person whose head reveals her to be very successful and persistent. Barnum's was an unusual experiment and it did not last long. Protests came from Sing Sing's chaplain and his wife. They wrote newspaper editorials about Farnham's use of improper books. They claimed she made unlawful use of the inmates time by not organizing them uh, to do productive labor. The chaplain didn't succeed in pushing her out but a new prison administration, one committed to harsher punishments for both, for especially for men, um, did push her out and she left in 1847. New matrons continued to experiment in ways that looked different from Farnham's and different from the regimes designed for men. Some external reformers recommended an experiment with the Pennsylvania system of total solitary confinement and silence for women as the only way to bring order uh, to the women's prison. Later matrons tried to get a labor workshop going. Um, here is a woodcut image of the workshop at Sing Sing uh, in the 1850s. The public continued to be interested as this spread uh, from the 1860s uh, in Harper's Weekly makes clear. People wanted to see what was happening uh, in the women's prison and they had strong opinions about what was happening in the female prison. But just as with men's prisons, state officials and reformers alike remained dissatisfied by the results the women's prison at Sing Sing produced. They wanted law abiding citizens, they wanted former women inmates to take up jobs in domestic service and be happy with their lot. But that's not what usually happened. By 1877, there was no consensus about the right disciplinary system for women in New York. Officials shut down Sing Sing's women's department. And by the turn of the century, the state had moved toward a reformatory model uh, and opened some new institutions that reflected uh, kind of changing ideas about discipline. I hope I've shown you some of the complex reasons behind women's different, uh, differential treatment and experience in New York's first female prison. It reflected societal standards that claimed to hold up women, but also punish them harshly, harshly when they did not achieve the ideal. It also, because of the low number of inmates, proved to be an experimental site. Farnham's focus on educational and aesthetic uplift minus the phrenology would appear again in prison discipline experiments at the turn of the 20th century and pops up time in, uh, in uh, our contemporary time as well. It also has moved from just uh, uh, experiments with uh, women and has also come into uh, experiments with prison discipline for men. So Farnham, although it was a short stint at Sing Sing Prison, um, I think has given us an example of how experimentation occurred and how ideas about gender could shape ideas about prison discipline. Thanks so much. Thank you, Professor, uh, very much. And um, there's a lot to talk about, and I think we're going to have some lively questions uh, for you to uh, respond to. Um, one question has come in from uh, uh, Sam 
Sam North, who is a faculty member at uh, Ossining High School and also a mm. um, uh, member of our board. Okay. Uh, and he asks, uh, considering the work done by men in the congregant system, why do you think that women never took in piecework or other kinds of work? Mm -hmm. So um, there were some experiments with women sewing um, and doing piecework. And that image from the 1850s shows that sort of effort. Um, but one of the things that uh, kind of got in the way of uh, a, a manual labor program uh, for women is that they also relied on women, uh, the small number of women at both Auburn and later at Sing Sing to do some of the domestic labor to keep the men's prison going. So women often did the laundry um, and were sewing uniforms and things like that. So part of their work was to uh, sustain the men's prison uh, that was at time, what that was seeking to have uh, to be economically sustainable. And I, I think I recall that one of the reasons the women's prison closed in 1877 was that it was not economically sustainable. And by that time, mm -hmm. the, the model, at least until the 1890s in the men's prison was to um, contract out the men's yeah. work. And, and that, that uh, map that you show, the bird's eye view, mm -hmm. if you look at the men's prison, there were a number of buildings that were used for industrial purposes, especially producing uh, stoves. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one of the biggest stove production operations in the, in the country was at Sing Sing. Yeah, um, iron, iron, cast iron stoves. Uh, we'll give Sam North an, a second question here that he okay. has. Maybe, maybe you touched on this a little. Uh, were working class women treated more harshly than middle class women in the criminal justice uh, and incarceration system in the antebellum period? I would say that middle class women uh, rarely uh, were in the system. Um, there were ways that families would uh, kind of deal with their the offenses of middle class women uh, that kept it out of public view. Um, so I think it's it's the vast majority of these cases were with working class uh, and poor women. Um, and and absolutely all the you know this is also a period in New York's history where. Um, uh, voluntary societies are trying to deal with issues of poverty. Um, uh, this is when the public schools are trying to get off the ground uh, to uh, educate children who are often laboring. Um, so this is in some ways part of a larger set of concerns about working women um, that provide a certain sort of kind of paternal organiza paternalistic organization of their lives. Um, we have several really good questions here. Um, one from uh... Sandy Galef, who is the uh, assemblywoman from Ossining, who's been very oh. supportive of the uh, <clears throat> of the Sing Sing Prison Museum, and she asked, were, were, "Was the women's prison demolished, or did it become the warden's property? Uh, do you know when Bedford Women's Prison opened?" I can answer the question about yeah, the please do <laughs> demolition. It, I don't know exactly when it was demolished, but it was demolished. It was not. It, there's no evidence. I believe the check. The chapel uh, at Sing Sing now is on the site of where the women's prison was located. Um, do you, can you, uh, when was Bedford was opened? Um, I think in the uh, 1890s. Yeah, um, I know that the reformatory model really kicks off in the mid 1880s and then we see some new institutions in the 1890s. Yeah. Um, and there's also some institutions built for men after the Civil War as well. Yeah. I, I'm wrong about Bed Bedford. I, I, what happened after 1877 was the women who were in Sing Sing were sent to county jails. Mm -hmm. um, and then it wasn't until the 1890s when there was an institution um, the asylum for, it was a mental institution in Auburn mm -hmm. that was repurposed as a women's prison, but then Bedford opened, uh, I think, in the early 20th century. Okay. Um, from uh, Sarah Kesey asked, were there any children on site? Were baby? Well, I think there is evidence mm -hmm. of babies being born there. Yes, yes, and, and it had a nursery. Um, so there was a site, uh, a spot within the building that was designated for children who were born there and living there. Um, sentences in that period tended to be shorter. I think in the United States today, we have much longer sentences uh, than uh, were used in the 19th century. So um, they were there for shorter amounts of time. So, in, uh, but they did keep their children with them uh, at the site. 
And I do have a clarification from Dana White, who is mm -hmm. uh, formerly a board of trustee member um, at the uh, for the Sing Sing Prison Museum, and now she's a member of the board of trustees of the Village of Ossining, oh. and was village historian. And oh, wow. she said that the female uh, prison was demolished in the 1920s okay. as new buildings were being built uh, at at Sing Sing. So thank you to mm -hmm. uh, to Dana, and and she also mentions that when the women's prison closed in 1877. There was an uh, male prisoners were housed there. Right. Um, uh, when there was an um, an overflow from the main mm -hmm. cell block uh, that you showed in that in that image, and that the ruins of that cell block are all the remains of the 19th century uh, mm -hmm. prison uh, from uh, at Sing Sing. Yeah, um, because it had the because the women's prison was designed to have the individual cells kind of stacked on top of each other. They could use it pretty easily for overflow uh, from the men's prison later. And was there indoor plumbing, do you know, in the women's prison? I don't. I, don't. I did not see any evidence of that in the writings about it. Uh, Judy Jackson asks, um, with, uh, phrenology, phrenology had, was no longer in vogue by the 1860s. Were theories mm -hmm. uh, being other, what theories were being explored in, in mm -hmm. the 1860s? Um, the era that the uh, illustration you showed, how, how would a woman who murdered uh, someone be treated? Um, so actually Farnham wrote that book, uh, published that book in the 1850s. And it's basically um, a phrenology volume written by someone else that she then adds a bunch of drawings and a set of appendices to um, related to her experience at Sing Sing. Um, and that's published, I think in 1856. So she's kind of bringing that phrenology, um, uh, like she's kind of pushing that to its very outer edge of its popularity, but she later becomes uh, interested in spiritualism uh, and, and some other kind of in vogue ideas that uh, are going around kind of New York liberal circles. Um, but I would say when the reformatory movement takes off toward the end of the 19th century, what you really start to see is a concern for how environment um, and conditions, environmental conditions, uh, shape uh, criminal behavior. Um, so people thinking much more about poverty, thinking much more about uh, uh, the availability of jobs, thinking much more about how childhood um, and being raised in certain ways might lead a person to uh, a life with uh, criminal infractions. So there's, there's less of a sort of punitive. It's a moment where the kind of punitive uh, approach wanes for a little while and a more reformative approach uh, kind of comes into vogue. And of course, that's a set of that's a wave that just never stops rolling in American history. Yeah, I think one of the the leading uh, reformers uh, who also was at Sing Sing and also was the first uh, psychiatric uh, clinic um, mm -hmm. was, uh, uh, established by by uh, Thomas Mott Osborne uh -huh. yeah. uh, in the progressive period in the yeah. 19 teens. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I see a lot of what you're uh, showing us um, in this pseudoscience of phrenology, mm -hmm. starting to look at the, the human mind as uh, the source of, of uh, an opportunity for reform or an mm -hmm. opportunity for uh, looking uh, at a different model rather than just corporal pu punishment. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Daniel Gross is a journalist uh, who was uh, enjoying your talk very much and said, can you tell us a bit about any of the favorite archives and texts where you found the, the documentation mm -hmm. of Sing Sing's early years? What, what were some of your sources? Uh, so because the um, both Auburn and Sing Sing uh, were built at a period in which the, uh, we talk about as the kind of explosion of the penny press, it became very inexpensive to print pamphlets and books of all sorts. Um, and so the 19th, 19th century uh, America is just kind of a wash in paper. And those included pamphlets and tracts about prison discipline. Um, and so a lot of libraries hold uh, some of these old tracts uh, that are printed. Uh, there are some about Auburn from the 1820s, uh, and then later some uh, from Sing Sing in the 1830s and 40s. Um, and so those tracts, uh, being able to see those pamphlets and tracts, uh, most of them are written by reformers. Um, every once in a while, you'll have a prison official who writes one. Uh, and then also state officials uh, would publish reports 
about what was happening in the, uh, the prisons. They had an obligation to report annually um, and be in contact with uh, the administration of each prison in the state. So there's actually a lot of descriptive data from people interested in the prison. Um, but what we don't have as much of, of course, is the voices of people who were incarcerated. Um, and so there's a few pamphlets that are attributed to um, inmates but uh, and former inmates. Um, but you have to kind of read those with a little bit of suspicion because they tend to be produced by presses used also by the reformers. Um, and it's quite likely that the reformers had a strong hand in producing those documents. Um, but there was an actually an amazing find a few years ago, um, a scholar at Yale found uh, the diary of an African American inmate from Auburn um, and has published it. Um, and it is remarkable. It's the only um, inmate uh, uh, source we have from a black inmate in the 19th century in New York. Um, so people keep finding um, diaries, letters, uh, but also lots of printed work. Um, but we're still on the lookout for more uh, voices from actual inmates themselves. I want to make sure that we um, that we answered this question uh, that came. I'm looking both at the chat and also. Mm questions and answers. In terms of after phrenology was no longer in vogue, um, were there other theories, uh, and maybe you answered this, other theories uh, um, that were then became popular in terms of incarceration or, or of women or other treatments? Well, I mean, there's still a serious uh, kind of contingent of reformers who have a classic Christian narrative mm -hmm. of sin uh, and the need for conversion. Um, so you, uh, there still is a strong kind of evangelical uh, kind of mission emphasis uh, in terms of that's the, that being the kind of best method for um, transforming uh, female inmates' lives. Um, and then there's a, a movement, some of the women that were involved in promoting Eliza Farman, uh, Farnham um, were also like some of the women in the Prison Association of New York um, and some uh, ancillary organizations. They started uh, what are basically halfway houses uh, for women who are discharged. And so I would say that there's also a kind of sense that um, this growing sense that incarceration caused more problems for a person than that than he or she already had and that mm -hmm. they then needed additional support once they left the prison um, so they could intervene in some ways in the prison but then they would need another intervention after and so this process of creating homes for um, people discharged from prison um, including some for women uh, are started in the period after the civil war mm -hmm. You know, we, we mentioned in the introduction that you, as an early age, visited uh, the mm -hmm. state prison in Indiana. Is there any one question from uh, from Stacy Horn that that uh, your research showed that uh, whether prison visitors in the 19th century, the the uh, women and reformists who visited the uh, the women and wrote, or wrote to the uh, women, mm -hmm. is there any evidence of that kind of interaction? So the, there's lots of famous visitors to New York's prisons. Charles Dickens comes and visits the tombs. Um, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville uh, tours the prisons. Uh, Margaret Fuller visits the women's prison um, at Sing Sing. So um, it was kind of a popular thing for public intellectuals to do um, in, in the 19th century. But there were also prisons and jails in the 19th century where you could really come almost like an attraction, like you could pay a quarter mm -hmm. and, and come and see men working in the yard. Or um, there were one of the most popular places was an institution that had a treadmill where men simply walked all, you know, for long periods of time. Uh, and you could come and pay a quarter and watch people, um, watch incarcerated people walk on the treadmill. So it was also, um, it was also in some ways uh, this strange aesthetic um, uh, uh, opportunity that people took, uh, like going to the movies or going to uh, Barnum's museum. Uh, so that, that is, I think, a very, very different um, feeling than what we have today. Um, and I would say also that the security at these places in the 19th century was not strong, um, uh, nothing at all like it is uh, in the present day. So. Uh, people would be throwing things over the walls. Um, uh, there were escapes throughout the 19th century um, and also lots of people coming in because uh, it was a way for uh, to make revenue um, when you had people who were willing to pay admission. 
Were there any women escapes that you uh, found? Um, I did not read of any women escapes. I did read uh, that there was a riot, although there's no details. So I'm a little suspicious of mm -hmm. an account of a riot because usually 19th century newspapers would have jumped on that and wanted all the gory details and would yeah. make some up if they didn't have them uh, from official sources. So I'm a little, I'm not so sure about it, but it is reported that one occurred before Farnham arrived. What were the um, offenses beside larceny and sex work was, was uh, maybe we, we covered this in terms of murder uh, or murder um, um, in self-defense or murder uh, from uh, in being raped or anything mm -hmm. like that? Um, any, it's any very other? rare. It's very, very rare. So um, that's that slide I had with stats uh, about um, Newgate Prison in 1801. Um, they there's a there are some later charts in that account um, that show the range of offenses for men. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of petty larceny, grand larceny, burglary, arson, counterfeiting. You know, a, uh, and then you know violent. You know, assault, murder, attempted murder. All of those things are there. Mm -hmm. For the women inmates, it's literally petty larceny, grand larceny. There's nothing else. Um, and that really remains true for like, there's, it's just very rare for it to be anything besides uh, small time uh, uh, stealing. Um, but then later there is more uh, uh, convictions of women involved in sex work, but it really like, it is a rarity for women to be um, uh, convicted of a violent crime in this period. And if they are, they are a newspaper sensation mm -hmm. um, because it's so unusual. Do you, do you have a sense of how long their sentences were? Uh, often very short. And this is true for men too. So if you were in for, uh, let's say arson uh, or attempted murder and arson was taken very, very seriously in this period because um, it really could lead to lots of death and destruction. Um, you might be in for seven years. Like uh, your average sentence in the first few decades of the 19th century was going to be two years, three mm -hmm. years. And you, and if someone is a really serious offender, they might be there for seven, mm -hmm. um, which I think is remarkable yeah. given the kind of sentencing um, that the system today uh, uh, mm -hmm. puts out. The, um, that pattern of, of women and men being uh, um, their sentences and their and their crimes being uh, treated differently. You know, at Sing Sing, of course, the, there were 614 executions at Sing Sing, mostly in the 20th century, and uh, there were eight women out of those uh, 614. Mm -hmm. So the, the punishment for men were, uh, were was very very different. Yeah. Um, the, the, in your work, I, you know, you mentioned about uh, visitors from all over the world coming to Sing Sing and coming to the US prisons. Did you, um, do a, did you discover anything about uh, uh, other countries at the same time, that, uh, how women were uh, treated in terms of incarceration in other, other parts of the world? Well, in some ways, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the model of Elizabeth Fry in England uh, was what inspired uh, women reformers in America mm -hmm. to start to advocate for um, specific reformatory programs for women. Um, but uh, I would say that what I know a little bit more about what develops eventually uh, when, because in like England actually has a lot more women incarcerated than the United States uh, in terms of percentages. Um, like there are prisons in 19th century America that have fewer than 10% of their inmates are women. Um, but in uh, England at the same time, there are at least a third of the inmate population across the board. Um, so in England, uh, so in different countries, there was much more willingness to uh, convict women. And I think in England, uh, because there was such an issue around poverty uh, and income inequality and unemployment, uh, that women were much more likely not only to um, be engaging in larceny to simply survive, but also were being convicted. There was a much more, I think, harsh approach um, to uh, impoverished people in general, including women. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say different countries over time also um, kind of one legal scholar has talked about how um, he has a thesis that depending on if a place is a democracy or a monarchy, um, they might have uh, 
different uh, prison, different kinds of prison disciplines. And his thesis is that democracies tend to actually have harsher punishment because they actually, it really matters um, who is a citizen because citizens can, like that people who are not actually using their citizenship properly um, are more harshly punished. Um, that's a, a scholar, James Q. Whitman. Uh, I don't know enough about like, prisons in Denmark mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. um, to be able to, but I think it's an interesting idea that when you have a democratic experiment uh, and you allow any citizen, uh, male citizen, of course, at this time uh, and white citizen to be voting, um, who has that privilege really matters. And of course, you know, the people who are still without voting privileges today um, are often people who have been, have a history of a felony. Mm -hmm. Um, were the, when the women, were these women, were, were they, um, when they were sentenced, was it a jury trial? Were they, um, um, was, it, was there anything, information on trial by jury or were these, uh, any? It's uh, very, it's very, um, the evidence is pretty slim and it often comes from newspapers. Um, court records can be, um, kind of, you might get a whole big batch of court records for a particular time and then there are none. Uh, so they're kind of uneven. Um, my sense is that that these were things that were turned over very quickly, um, not high drama affairs, um, and often probably did not involve juries um, because they were such minor offenses for women. Um, and that once again, if they did involve a big jury trial, it was going to be covered in the press. Mm -hmm. um, whether it was a woman as an offender or a woman um, when there are there are some kind of murder cases in New York in the 19th century where the woman is a victim, um, but she's perhaps a, a higher status person, upper class person. And then that also, that trial would uh, gain a lot of media attention. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Dan Gross for that for that question. Uh, Dana White had uh, a couple of other comments to help us. Uh, there was no in indoor plumbing in the yeah. prison, uh, and also the uh, the diary or the memoir you referred to of the uh, African American prisoner in the 19th century is Austin Reed. Yeah. Um, and um, Caleb Smith, a professor at uh, at Yale University, was the uh, person who. The, uh, was involved in getting that uh, memoir published. Yeah. And it is quite, quite extraordinary. It's amazing. It yeah. is amazing. So we're coming close to the cl uh, end of our program. And I, we talked about this a little bit earlier this week about the incident in Atlanta with, mm -hmm. um, and the whole issue of, of, uh, of minorities and sex work. And, mm -hmm. and uh, do you see any, any relevance to the, what we're learning from your mm -hmm. research? to understand that event uh, today? Well, I think one thing that is quite clear and that scholars who have been pushing for a sort of intersectional analysis um, uh, is that for that, that the experience of misogyny and the experience of racism um, is uh, experienced in particular ways in particular kinds of racialized bodies. And so, um, the experience uh, an Asian American woman has in this country is this kind of interest is this kind of in, uh, uh, interesting and really particular combination of sexism and racism. And for Black women, uh, it is a different configuration. And I think we can see that we can see the way these ideas were already at play um, in the comments that you know. The, when I read the Thomas Eddy. Uh, comment about black women, uh, like Thomas Eddy, if you read some of his stuff, you would think he is a Quaker. He believes the inner light is in everyone. Um, he, he designs this first prison in New York. He runs this first prison in New York. You, he's anti-slavery. He's pro-public schools. You know, he is about as liberal as you can be for a Protestant in this period. And yet he says these absolutely disparaging things about black women. And for him, it's um, about their blackness and about their uh, being female. Um, and so I think, you know, the roots of this go so deep and the way that it is sexualized, um, I think we can also see in the attitudes about sex work in the period um, and the way that sex work is particular, I think the way that it shows in the, um, 
in the literature in that period, in the periodicals and the um, representations and visualizations is that there's this sense that it is even worse when it's white women, right? That the expectation is that uh, women with racialized bodies that are not, not on white, like that might happen to them, but that it's an even bigger problem when white women fall into this fallen woman paradigm. So I think we really can see it already. Um, and it has to be kind of pulled apart and picked apart and resisted um, continually. So uh, we have just another one or two minutes. Thank you. That was really, really interesting. And how do your students um, react to this material? Are they interested? Mm -hmm. Are they because we're we're in the in the um, in the Sing Sing Prison Museum? We're always thinking about our audience. We're always thinking about who are we developing this museum for. We have a number of different uh, opportunities to engage audiences. Uh, mm -hmm. say, I should mention Sam North, the faculty. Uh, a uh, member mm -hmm. of Austin High School is teaching a course on criminal justice um, that we helped uh, develop the curriculum. Oh, wow. And but how how do college students uh, react to this material? Do you have a chance to to talk to them about it? Well, I would say kind of I see two things. Um, I feel like college students right now are incredibly active around issues of racial justice and uh, gender justice um, and like. At, at UT this uh, past year, there was a huge student response to the Black Lives, Ladder, uh, Black, Black Lives Matter movement, including very successful demands they made of the university. Um, so you would think that that might translate into a deep concern for issues of mass incarceration, but these are also young people whose experience of, in, of incarceration, at least uh, for many of them, is through media. Right. Mm -hmm. It's about movies. It's about Orange is the New Black. And mm -hmm. um, so part of it, I think, uh, I think kind of thinking about incarceration, if it hasn't touched you personally. Right. I also do have some students for whom it has touched them personally and they they have a much more um, mature and uh, sophisticated take on these issues. But I think for many um, this, the issues around incarceration require a certain kind of empathy and maturity that has not been cultivated in them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, perhaps the, alt, the opposite has been done by um, media. Mm -hmm. So part of it for me is to actually do this work of sort of, of humanizing um, uh, uh, the kind of the history of incarceration and, and the reasons for incarceration and the racialized and gendered aspects of its history, um, because they're not there. Mm -hmm. um, they have that analysis in other parts of life, but they don't yet about prisons. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it, it requires them, I think, to grow up a little bit. Well, that's, that's a, an interesting observation, a good way to end our program. And I know for me and for our staff and I do want to recognize Victoria Gonzalez and Nicole yes. Hamilton and Thank you. Nicole Bell Derisi who are behind the scenes but always really doing great work and our mm -hmm. board of trustees. For all of us, we subscribe to the approach you're taking and our, uh, we are not interested in uh, sort of a voyeuristic or mm -hmm. sensationalistic or um, 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 uh, hi hyper uh, sensational approach to uh, this subject. It's a serious subject and you did a wonderful job tonight in oh, um, uh, engaging us and, and really introducing us to a very complex story. So on behalf of the Sing Sing uh, Prison Museum on Humanities New York and um, J. Philip uh, Real Estate, our, our sponsors, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really enjoyed it.